It's a huge day for your money today with both stocks and commodities. We've got the whole thing covered. John Brady, who's been trading in the pits of the CME Group all day. Pat Dorsey with Sanibel Captiva Trust. Lee Munson with Portfolio LLC. Let's start with oil. It's getting very close to $110, Peter. Uh, how long do you think this run-up continues? John. John, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, David. Uh, the, the, the grind higher in oil is most likely going to continue given the rising tensions in the Middle East. There seems to be no clear-cut decision which way the major players are going to go, and thus there's going to be an embedded floor underneath the price of oil. What traders don't like, David, investors don't like, is that going into the weekend, you have this liquidity gap between Friday afternoon and Monday morning, and thus what traders ask themselves is, what is the balance of risks? And over the course of the weekend, some type of geopolitical event would lend itself to higher prices. That's why you're seeing the strong finish. Yeah, exactly. I mean, Iran and Israel can argue over the weekend. Things just don't just stop on a Friday. But Pat Dorsey, can you really talk about Dow 13,000 without also bringing oil into the conversation? And it's not necessarily a negative to see high oil because two Dow components, ExxonMobil and, of course, Chevron, are Dow components. And they're doing well. Certainly, uh, you know, energy earnings are a large and rising part of the overall earnings of the market, so there is an offset there. Um, you know, bigger picture, I mean, you want to ask whether the higher prices of oil are coming from stronger demand or tighter supply. Right now, it's a combination of both, with the balance being tighter supply in these worries in the Middle East that were referred to by your, by your previous guest. But I think the market, you know, can continue to move higher simply because people anchor on the 70s and think about these long gas lines and oil's a killer for the economy, prices get high, but they forget that we're much less energy intensive economy today than we were 40 years ago and so we're more resilient when it comes to triple digit oil prices than we were in the 70s great point peter schiff from euro pacific capital joins us peter you don't have to go back to the 70s i went back to 2008 when we saw that huge spike in oil up to 140 dollars yeah. a barrel in three months it was down yeah. below $40 yeah. a barrel. That was entirely a monetary phenomenon. Yeah. That is, it was well, the first, Fed first yeah. printing too much money and then well, getting too tight. Is that what's happening now? Well, absolutely. First of all, that last point wasn't a great point. I would argue that we're more dependent on, than ever on, on oil. We have to import so much of it with, with, with dollars that we export. But there is only one reason that the price of oil is going up, that the price of gasoline is going up here in the United States. And that's because the Federal Reserve has to print a lot of money to monetize all these budget deficits and to keep interest rates artificially low. The result of that is that oil prices are rising. And it's a global phenomenon because, remember, we export our dollars all around the world, and so foreign central banks buy them by printing their own money. So this is all monetary driven. It's our fault. There is nobody else to blame. It's not the fault of Iran. It is a tax. We are paying higher gasoline prices because we have lower payroll taxes. This is how we are financing government. They're not taking our purchasing power through taxation. They're taking it through inflation. And it's not just oil prices. We, Americans are going to have to get used to a much higher cost of okay. living. The price of everything is going to go up, and it's going to go sky high. John Brady, uh, Peter is, is right on certainly an important point, and that is if you look at fundamentals, let's give people some hard facts about oil and gasoline right now. Now, we are our inventories for gasoline are at multi year highs. People are using less of it. If supply is up, the price should have come down. What are the traders saying in the pits? Well, I, I think one of the concerns that we may forget is that it's not so much the oil that we import from the Middle East, Liz, it's what our trading partners import from the Middle East, Germany and Japan. And if there's some type of shock to the to the global oil markets, it's global trade that's really going to suffer. I do agree with Peter's points as it regards monetary policy and the debasing of the dollar lending itself to this to this artificially high rate. And I think that probably will continue as there were more murmurs in the pits this week about the Fed perhaps adding additional chapters to this whole idea of quantitative easing and operation twist. But don't but keep in mind, too, it's our trading partners, Germany and Japan, specifically that really rely on that Middle Eastern oil. Wait, Pat, I still think Pat made an excellent point about oil because we are less no, energy dependent. No. Yes, he did. <laughs> but we're we moving are. on, Peter. Peter we're because moving it's on. The we're moving we're on to David. David, it's David to the only import that we have. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a lot David to cover here, and we want to give our investors out there the best opportunity to buy what's important. And Pat Dorsey, I'm going back to you as, as we do head, some people say, towards uh, Dow 13,000. Whether or not that's an important number or not, the point is that equities are still very well valued compared to bonds, are they not? 
Yeah, I mean, you know, you think about the 10-year Treasury at um, you know 2 percent. In, in equity terms, that's 50 times earnings. You know, or you compare a two percent yield for bonds with a seven percent earnings yield for equities right now across the board, and of course that equity income stream grows over time. Bonds are fixed; that's why it's called fixed income. So you tell me which is cheaper: a seven percent yield that grows over time, or a two percent yield that doesn't equities, budge? Equities. Peter, I mean, you're you're certainly buying equities, just not necessarily U.S. centric, right? Well, no. I mean, I'm buying the commodities. We own a lot of oil. We own a lot of oil stocks. We own a lot of gold and silver. You know, in terms of gold and silver, gasoline is actually getting cheaper right now. It's not getting more expensive. So that shows you it's inflation. But we're buying stocks all around the world. I particularly like to buy stocks in a lot of the Asian economies because that's where the consumers are going to be getting wealthier. They're the ones that are going to be buying all the stuff that Americans can no longer afford. So you want to own companies that are going to benefit from the growth abroad, not the ones that are going to suffer from the decline here at home. John, how much do the guys in the pits really think about the numbers? I mean, I know you're not a big fan. Nobody's a big fan of Dow because they think it's a smaller index. S&P is a large one, much more important. But do these, how much do these numbers play into trades? Well, I think the 13,000 number at this level, uh, David, has been rather large. And it's really large from a psychological perspective and specifically for the retail investor. Recall in 2011, calendar year 2011, we sort of challenged the 13,000 level three times, only to fail at 12,900, 12,850. So getting above 13,000 is a sign of progress. It's a little bit of an emotional rescue, so to say for an investor class that's been beaten up over the last seven, eight years. So psychologically, it's important. What the real race now is for traders in the pit is to see how quickly it takes to go from 13,000 to 14,000. And with monetary policy as easy as, as it is, and with the relative value in equities as compared to fixed income, it may be sooner than you think. Mm -hmm. Well, it could be moot as well, gang, if, if Europe matters. And, and let's throw it out to you, the money guys. Does Europe matter? Pat. Well, I think a lot of nastiness has been priced into Europe. I mean, we've seen some pretty mass downgrades of bonds. Markets have continued to move higher. And I think it's important to separate the economic impact of the current debt crisis in Europe, which is causing a recession in Europe. So Europe grows slower. Companies dependent on Europe will grow slower. And that's a real concern with the, I think, overblown risks of Lehman Mark II, which is, you know, this fears of a global credit crunch, which are, in my mind, completely overblown when you look at the relative levels of interbank bank lending rates in Europe versus globally, there is very little nervousness outside of Europe. And that indicates to me that that credit crunch, while it may pertain in Europe, is not going global, which is a critical uh, see, difference uh, between today and late all right, 2008. Well, Peter, I, I, know you, I know you think the Fed prints too much money, but certainly the Europeans are printing a lot of money to, for their bailouts as well, are they not? Well, well, they certainly are. But, you know, one of the problems uh, from Europe is that the situation might improve, at least in the short run, we might have more confidence in the eurozone and the euro currency. And that's bad news for Americans because that will drive the dollar down even faster against other currencies. That means oil prices and other prices are going to rise and it's going to put more upward pressure on on interest rates, which is going to force the Fed to print even more money if it wants to keep rates from rising. And that just pours fuel on the inflationary fire. And you know, who knows? I mean, we could be looking at back up. You know, we were at one hundred and fifty dollars a barrel in 2008 uh, in July and August, we can be up there again uh, by this summer if we keep printing money. Well, yeah. And, and, and John, I know you guys watch the euro dollar, dollar versus euro very closely. I don't know if we can get our hot board up. We just showed the chart. It's been awfully volatile with highs and lows, certainly. But uh, that matters to people watching and their portfolios. At $1.34, I saw a prediction that we could hit $1.37 soon, meaning the euro gets stronger, the dollar gets more weak. Well, you know, Liz, about an hour ago, the CFTC reported their weekly commitments to traders data. And we saw open interest okay. against the euro. Short positions held by hedge funds drop Explain about 4%. Explain what that means, 4%. John, to our viewers, open interest well, are, and, and what it really uh, actually sure, signifies. Sure. Th those are positions that are reported every day right. and every week to both the exchanges and to the CFTC. And it just shows net positioning of the market. And regarding non-commercial accounts, which, which are basically hedge funds and other, other types of institutional investors, the short base, so the, the shorts on the euro currency, dropped 4% in the latest week. That's a rather significant move. And what it tells me is that the short positions on the euro that have been looking for this situation to go from bad to worse are finding it very hard to hold on to those positions. 
and they're buying their euro currency positions back, Liz, at higher levels. Because they Taking believe the losses. in the euro. Yeah. That's right. And, you know, next week, we'll see the second chapter of the LTRO coming out of the ECB on Tuesday, Wednesday. The whisper okay. number amongst traders is about $490 billion of euros being uh, readministered to the banks. All right, folks, this is a terrific, great way to end the week. But